Oh, I have a broken heart. Wait, who's talk? Who has a broken heart? Who? I got a broken heart. Oh. Uh, what? Shocks, Mox? Is that you? No, it's Cheesy no, Manfredo, it's, I think. It's me, Cheesy Manfredo. I'm Are you going to say you heart. have a broken heart because I haven't read your comic yet? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cheesy Cast, a sporadic artist online interview series podcast. I'm your host, Cheesy Manfredo, a.k.a. Alfredo Morales, and with me here today is a podcast legend, uh, absolute king, maybe, maybe the funniest guy on the internet, uh, Asterios Coconuts. Go ahead, Asterios. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. It's nice of you to invite me and to care enough to talk. My own family that won't even reach out to see how I'm doing as much as you will, Cheesy Man Fredo. God damn it. You've been trying to get me on this show for a while. I haven't heard oh, from yeah, my grandma forever. in months. So thank you. It's nice. Uh, of course. Of course. Yeah, I am. Um, you know, I, I try to get everyone, uh, everyone that I'm fan on on eventually. Uh, mostly for clout reasons. This is a very clout-hungry podcast, if you will. Um, but bes- but besides that, I'm glad you're on. And I and I guess in case for the people who don't know who you are, what do you what do you do specifically, Asterios? What's your what's your end game? Sure, I'm a com- I'm like a comedian. I'm a stand-up comic. I'm a podcaster. I host a show called The Loudest Podcast, uh, which guarantees to be the loudest podcast on the internet. It's me and my completely insane co-host, Sriracha. And we just talk about whatever weird stuff is interesting her that week. Maybe it'll be cryptocurrency. Maybe it'll be a Barbie movie from 1997. Like, uh, uh, this week she she was uh, totally obsessed with this uh, this woman who released an awful, awful TikTok. A millennial was so pissed off at Gen Z, I guess for being young and happy, mm-hmm. that uh, she released a song called Gen Z, You Can Suck It. And Gen Z made fun of this song so much that she had to delete the song from the internet. But oh, the internet no. never forgets. So never now forgets. TikTok is just filled with thousands of 14-year-old girls just clowning on this woman and duetting the fuck out of her. And it's really, really funny. Oh man, that fucking uh poor poor boomers. It's it's hard being a boomer out here. Yeah, well the thing is she's a millennial. Uh, boomers know that kids, you know, they're kids. What are you gonna do? I think this millennial thought that she could like clown kids. And it's like as a boomer, you just know, like, yeah, you you can't clown kids. They have literally nothing better to do. How do you how do you think you're gonna step on to the ultimate Zoomer platform, which is TikTok, and yep. think you could one up people there, you know? Yup. Exa- yes, a big mistake. Yup. The the ultimate bringing a knife to a gunfight scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's always it's always a hoot. Um you know what I kind of like I think I've been following your, I guess, career ever since um I think the the first person to get me on to you, I think, was Monkey Jones back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I, you and him used to have a podcast together. And um, I think, and I've heard your name be like float around like all the time because I think you're you just consistently on other people's podcasts, right? I just like talking to people. I'm very lonely. Like <laughs> the reason I'm on your show right now is my girlfriend is out of town for two weeks, and so it's like, well. I got nothing to do. So maybe I was like, I, maybe so, I could be your girlfriend, big bro. Yeah, maybe not. Uh, but I was <laughs> like, uh, but I was just like, you know what? So I just sent out a tweet. I was like, if you've ever wanted me on your podcast, this is the time. I have, I am free right now. I I really pounced on that opportunity like a, like a hawk, you know? Because yes. I, yeah, I have been trying to get a stereos on the podcast because originally this podcast was just like different um artists on the internet right but i've been so sort of like pseudo shifting it to whoever i like really want you know mm-hmm. and i want to do a, i want to do a comic book podcast with stereos because i know he's a fan of comics right but um uh we, we couldn't do it uh it was a lot of a lot of things got in the way busy and then covid happened you know 
complicated as shit, right? But any, but anyway, um, I think I also, yeah, yeah, I'm also, um, I'm also friends with your, uh, your girlfriend, your co-host Sriracha, mm-hmm. and I, I'm one of the several people who just send her like random things in her DMs. Okay. Uh, in the hopes that she might talk about it on the loudest on the loudest podcast, you know. What's the what kind of stuff do you what kind of stuff do you message her? Because people are always messaging her, totally insane nonsense. It's great. I think um, one of the one of the more tamer things I sent her was mm-hmm. uh when she was uh, getting obsessed with North Korea cinema. I DM'd her. I said, "Hey, have you heard about a movie called Pulgasari?" Which is like the only North Korean kaiju movie. What? Tell, tell me more about this. This sounds uh, interesting. Well, the the most interesting fact about this movie is that the director was kidnapped from South Korea and forced to make this movie. Jesus Christ! <laughs> that's terrible. That, yeah, that that's awful, right? But I, he did he did manage to escape back when the movie was uh, done wrapping up, you know, and um. I, the movie's free to watch on YouTube, actually. And it's not that bad. Like, I watched it with a couple of friends. We did a podcast about it, right? And um, the movie is, like, very, like I was, like, thinking, like, okay, when is the North Korean propaganda gonna hit? But I think it's a little bit more subtle, you okay, know? I'm listening. I want to hear. Yeah. Okay. Cause, okay, so, like, the plot synopsis is basically, like, there's, like, an emperor, and he's, like... He he's obviously like putting the the common the working man down, you know, like like there's uh, the emperor wants to expand his like armory, so he forces a bunch of like farmers to like give up their tools, their farming tools, so they can melt them into weapons, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the the blacksmith that's forced to do it, like he's all like, no, I won't do it, and then they lock him up, and they and they starve him in jail, right? Like they okay. don't feed him. Until he, until he's, until like you know, to force him to make the weapons, right? But instead, he um, he grabs like a bunch of like leftover like rice that his daughter like, uh, snuck into the jail cell for him. He grabs his rat, this rice, and he forms like a little figure, a little like a uh, dinosaur creature thing, right? And he um, I think he like prays it, prays to it as this kind of like act of revenge. And this little creature um, I well. It, it doesn't come to life yet. It doesn't come to life until, like, the daughter, I think she accidentally spills some blood on the little doll, and it comes That'll to life. That'll make like a, a doll come to life for sure. You're yeah, going to want to keep blood away from dolls, especially if you're, like, on a quest or you're in some sort of, like, specific genuine peril. Right, exactly. It's like it's like no one's seen the opening of Child's Play 3. <laughs> Okay, but that being said, the, the dog comes to life, and it's like this little, cute little creature. He's pretty harmless until he starts eating metal. This creature specifically wants to eat nothing but metal, mm-hmm. right? And the more metal it eats, the bigger it gets, and it gets, like, massive, you know? It, it gets godzilla size, right? Because it eats so much metal, right? But but um, what's what's cool is that this, this creature only follows the orders of the daughter, the daughter who, like, spilled blood on, on the creature, right? And and the daughter is friends with like a rebel group that wants to take down the emperor, right? Okay, that's so cool. so the yeah. rebel, yeah, the rebel group uses the, this creature is called Pulgasari, right? Mm-hmm. And they 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 command Pulgasari to help them fight the the emperor's army, and Pulgasari like wipes the shit out of the emperor's army, right? Like just destroys everything. Like the uh, the the generals try to try to come up with so many schemes to stop Pulgasari, right? In its tracks. There's so many like like wacky little things. Like they try to they try to like make it fall into a giant hole and they and they pile rocks on it so it's stuck, but it but it doesn't manage to escape, right? Um Pogosaur is just OP. He's like so powerful. Um they literally invent like a cannonball in the movie to try mm-hmm. to shoot it down, but Pogosari like catches it in its mouth and it shoots it right back, right? And then and then he then he kills the Emperor. He literally like steps on him and like murders him, right? And then, and then you think that's like the end of the story, like yay, the day has been saved, right? But there's this kind of like, there's this kind of like ethical dilemma going on because like they took down the emperor, but Pogasari still wants to consume metal, right? And like, the the thing is, it's kind of like they gotta constantly give up metal to Pogasari, and and the daughter realizes, oh man, if if Pogasari stays around, he's gonna, he's just gonna consume so much metal, it's gonna force us 
as a people to become imperialists, just like the emperor, and take over other lands so we could take their metal, just defeat it to pull Gasari, right? So the daughter, and I, this is like AS massive spoilers, but um, it's, it's all free to watch on YouTube. But the daughter, what she does is that she um she hides in a giant iron bell, and she rings it to get Pogasari's attention. And Pogasari eats the bell with the daughter in it. Oh no! And, yeah, and it, it creates some sort of like kind of loophole to to the whole blood contract where you know Pogasari can only eat metal, but since like he accidentally eats a human, Pogasari starts like disintegrating back into rock, right? And then uh, the the daughter, like, she kind of sacrifices herself, kind of very similar to the ending of the original uh, Godzilla movie. If I don't know if you've seen that, but I so both not. movies end with, a, yeah, well, all you got to know is both movies end with a big sacrifice, with a big kind of, like, ethical dilemma sacrifice, right? So, th- that, so that's how they stop Pogasari at the end, you know? And it's, it's so crazy because, I, like, a lot of people kind of interpret the movie, even though it was made in North Korea as propaganda, it feels a little anti-North Korea. A lot of people think Polgazari is supposed to be like a metaphor for the Soviet Union and it's trying to convince like the North Koreans you don't got to rely so much on the Soviets, you know? Hmm. Like, I think it was made in the 80s, so the I think the Soviet Union was still around. Well, look, it's a metaphor for something, that's for sure. Every <laughs> time there's a monster, it's a metaphor for nuclear war. The uh, Russian imperialism, Cap- capitalism, horniness. A lot of times, it's I mean, like Jason, like, like he's like a yeah. horny, he's like a horniness monster. Like, there's he's, a reason he's always killing like kids who are all horned up. Like he's he, that guy's that guy's horny on Maine. You, you think so? You think Jason's horny? Do, do you know about all these like like slasher movie fans who are very horny for Jason? Uh, I I'm listening. Uh, oh yeah it's it's a it's a whole subcategory people just want to like okay for example i'm gonna put um i have a partner and i I love them to death all right Mm -hmm. but they're very Mm -hmm. horny for freddy krueger they love freddy krueger it it's just i i don't really know how to explain it but they love freddy krueger they love jason they have they have a freddy krueger body pillow that's on their bed it's do they uh, love fred okay question do they love freddy krueger or do they love the attention they get for saying that they love Freddy Krueger? No, no, they're not. They're not that. They're not like that. Really? They, they really do love Freddy Krueger. Uh-huh. They got their their whole their whole room is decked out in Freddy Krueger stuff. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh, it, this isn't like a this is they, they're not showing this off. It's just okay. like mm-hmm. it's something I I found out like getting to know them. You know, and I mean I love them to death, and they <laughs> it's great. It's awesome. <laughs> okay, so all right, so like this didn't come up on the first date. No. At no. what point I, into your relationship did it come up that that your partner jerks it to pedophile Freddy Krueger, someone whose <laughs> face is made up of their murder victims? I, I I think it. I don't think it's specifically the looks. It might be a personality thing, you know. I think it's a. You know, looks are a I, very I think, important part of of someone's personality. <laughs> yeah, like that, yeah, I, mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, I guess. But I think um, it's. I, I think it stems from their like, oh man, I don't want to really put them too much on the spot. Well, you've already started talking about how your partner <laughs> likes to jerk it to, to a they, razor fi- to a to America's most famous razor fingered pedo. I'm just I'm just <laughs> pointing that this isn't a door you want to open if you're not prepared to walk through Cheesy Man <laughs> Fredo. Oh no. Just oh, warning no. you. Look, this nice. is, look, future podcast advice I get. All right, but moving on. Um, yeah, so look, monsters always represent something. Why couldn't they just send this metal monster to space? Um, well, it, it was um, it was 18th century North Korea. You no, know, they couldn't use some, some kind of clockwork. Really? There was no clockwork, <laughs> kind of. This isn't like a steampunk type universe, you know, where they could just. There's always just some sort it. of clockwork steampunk bullshit. <laughs> I want to um I think um I think I think Pogasari needs to make a comeback because you, you know you know how the kids are nowadays like cap uh communism is making a comeback you know the kids love um, communism the kids love communism I, I'm like a far left I'm a, I'm an SJW I'm a, I'm a soy boy I'm all those words mm-hmm. and um I think uh, we need Pogasari to come back and he needs to fight uh, he needs to fight against like a monarchy you know the only kaiju I think Pogasari should be fighting is a uh, King Ghidorah. He literally has the word king in his name. 
Yo, no one can take what? down King Ghidorah. Are you, you kidding me? King Ghidorah, King Ghidorah's got many heads and many plans. You, you got to be careful, Ron. Be careful, Ron. King no, Ghidorah. He get, every movie, careful, every movie King, King Ghidorah, Ghidorah shows up, he gets his ass kicked, yeah. though. Yeah, well, yeah, look, but he wins the day in the end. <laughs> True or what, false? What, uh, false. He he gets his ass kicked every time. But look, okay, I'll be honest. The only thing I know about King Geeter is the album, which I love. Oh, oh, I love the album too. The album is great, and it's like you know, MF Doom. He rules. MF Doom's uh, uh, based rest, as hell. Re, uh, rest in peace, MF Doom. Yep, R.I.P. Uh, the real one. Mm -hmm. uh, the the best villain around. That's oh, exactly man. right. Metal face Doom. Mm -hmm. you, oh man, can I can I put you on the spot for a minute? No. Okay. Cool. So anyway, why would you uh, ever ask someone that? I'll tell you that right. <laughs> well, hey, hey, can I make you deeply uncomfortable for a second? No, but if look, if you have a question, you just ask whatever question you have. I mean, what what am I gonna, you know? Shoot your <laughs> shot. Shoot your shot, King. Okay. Okay. So um uh so if, in case anyone hasn't known the little history me and Asterio's got, um I sent him a free copy of my comic, and I think he knows what I'm gonna ask him right now. Yeah. Have you read it? Look, it's full of clowns fucking. It's, it's not full of clowns fucking. See, this is how I know you haven't read it, because you said that. I've seen your art, and it's big titty clowns who fuck. <laughs> so, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. Everyone on this podcast who's drawn a big titty clown that fucks, raise your hand. Not so fast, Asterios Kokonos. <laughs> It's it's true, but like villain versus uh -huh. not that. Like, it's true. It's, it's true. true. It's so you true. Can like, see I'll, why I'll I might that. be a little reluctant to open up a book that, where if I open it, a bunch of uh, balloon snakes and jizz might pop out. You never know what's in these clown fuck books. <laughs> you never know. Now, how much of this podcast is about your clown fucking fetish? A hundred percent. Two hundred percent. Only like twenty percent. It only comes up once in a while, you know. Okay. There's okay. not too much clown fuckery going on. No, I just wanted to. So the I, book I is not. I I just want to. I want to be clear. So the there's book no is clown not. Fucking. All right. Are not, there not, big? T okay. All right. There's no. There's no clown fucking. I, I I gotta say though, and I think we both know this for a fact that like, there doesn't have to be like clown insertion, for it to be clownosexual. <laughs> are there okay? Are there bear? Are there cleavage bearing big titty clowns in the comic you sent me? Uh, no, there is not. There, oh, oh really? No. Nope. Okay. I remember I said it, cleavage bearing. Uh, no, there there is cleavage, but that's like uh several mm -hmm. chapters later. Okay. Oh, okay. So not oh, so not in book one. Okay. So you wait. So you make them wait a couple of books to. You, you gotta introduce. You gotta introduce the world first, Asterios. You know, oh. you gotta get them used to the world, and once they're up to speed, you know, that's when you start giving them the cleavage. You know. Oh, I know a world I'd like. I'd like to introduce these big titty clowns to. Okay, all right, all right. I'll tell you what. At the end okay. of this podcast, I will open the comic. I'll start to mm -hmm. page through it, and we will see how much, how many cleavage, how much clown cleavage is in this book. If there's a lot of clown cleave in this book, can, I'm just saying. Okay, mm -hmm. here's a here's a suggestion. Can we get a live reaction to yeah. the potential oh, yeah. clown what, cleavage? That's why I'm saying I will read the book live on air. Yes, I. That is that is my promise to you. And but if I see anything weird, I have a paper shredder right here. Uh, oh, you know what? That's huh? your right. Because you know what? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Because I have full faith you're not going to see anything weird. All right. Well, this is a good. I'll tell you what. Because I have a book. I also have a comic book called Toys for Cheap. 100% oh, yeah. clown jizz free. That's the Coconuts guarantee. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'll tell you what. If I, if I open your book and, I don't, and there's nothing weird in it that gives me a boner that I will have to explain to a therapist for a year. I'll send you a free copy of my book, Toys for Cheap, on sale at Amazon.com and at independent Ooh. bookstores nationwide. Plug, couple, plug, plug, plug. I was just about to suggest a, you to a put of the years, plug. I was... A couple of years ago. <laughs> nationwide! <laughs> in, in 2017. <laughs> nationwide! I, 
nationwide. Yep, it's Stereos Coconos uh, at Patreon.com. Hell That's right. Yeah. Let's. All right. So ask the rest of your questions. <laughs> I was just. I just. Want you know to how many more off. podcasts I'm on tonight? I'm on eight. I'm on you, eight uh, more. No, I know, but I look. I'm on one more podcast. That's not eight, but. Uh, how long do you? How long do you think uh, you got? Like uh, you could be on this one for. How long are your episodes usually? Uh, there's like under two hours. Oh, oh my god! What do you talk to someone about for two hours? It's uh, it's crazy. Uh huh. Uh, who knows? Who knows? You're gonna have to be here for two hours to find out. Well, I won't be. I guarantee you that. Uh, look. No, let me see. Let, no. The, uh-huh. Yeah. Let me see how long I've been on this call so far. All right, it's eight thirty-eight. I don't know. Another twenty, twenty-five minutes. Uh, a couple more twenty minutes. Yeah, like twenty, twenty-five. Get it. How about this? Instead of releasing a two-hour podcast that's all bloated, let's make this a tight, right? Let's make this as tight as the clown ladies you love. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I agree. I agree. I guess we should get to the to the thick of it. What I really wanted to uh, get from you, Stereos, because I uh, I know you like comic books, right? This is I love correct, comic right? Books. Yes, I love comic books. Okay, I, I want to get. What are the Asterios Coconos approved comics? What are the comics you think more people should read? What are the ones you think are like the mwak, the cream, the cream of the crop? No, that's a, thank you for asking. Um, you know the nice thing about comics is that people already know like the big ones, they like the big famous ones they should read. Like you know you got to read Watchmen, and you know you right. got to read The Dark Knight Rises. Like right. don't be stupid and not read the not read the dark Knight. like don't be an idiot read the dark Knight rises even though that guy went crazy (laughs) look look he he, look he may be far right but at least he hates trump's he hates trump am i right oh i didn't know that but i believe it Uh, it's just you know look look that guy look that guy may have gone nuts and and wanted to make a comic book where batman literally fought osama bin laden called holy terror batman like that may have been his that may have been a legitimate pitch of his but um but that's a good comic the dark knight rises one look let's let's be honest if batman was real he probably would try to hunt down osama bin laden of course he would yes obviously there's no one i would there's no one i would have wanted on that seal team six helicopter more than the batman himself you, you know, but I just don't one- trust Frank Miller to uh, I I just don't trust Frank Miller to tell these stories with uh. He, it's the xenophobia, you know. Maybe if he wasn't so xenophobic, we would have had a fun Batman versus Osama bin Laden comic, you know. But it's just tough out there. But yeah, post uh post day one after nine eleven, you know, Osama bin Laden would have been caught the next day by Batman. Yeah, of course, Batman yeah, would have been course. there on Batman. Would have been there on one of those planes. I'm telling you, he, he, he would have been like uh, Marky Mark. Uh, yeah. He would have stopped those people. He it would have been things would have gone a little bit different if Batman was there. He would have Marky Murked the fuck out of those terrorists. <laughs> I'll tell you what, because like the thing about Batman that everyone always forgets is that he's a a master of disguise and b very funny. So like there would be like a there would be like some nervous flight attendant who's like oh i i, I don't know i'm not sure what oh, and then all of a sudden boom it's batman he punches you nine times it's batman <laughs> he's on all the four planes at once somehow okay this is very offensive let's just move on from this entire cut now i'm um, getting into this is why i didn't want frank miller handling this He's got no. He just. He does not it, have. It, it, it's tough. It's tough to make a Batman versus Osama bin Laden comic without you know uh, becoming extremely offensive. You know. Yes. <laughs> Very tough to pull off. Um, but I'll tell but you, yeah, like, so- a, I'll tell you, like, a comic that I I do like that I do think is cool is uh, there's this comic that I really did called uh, Fifty Two, and mm-hmm. um, it's kind of famous, but I I mean I just but it's. You know, it's not like up there with like whatever happened to the man of tomorrow or Red Sun. Um, Mm -hmm. DC had this interesting experiment where they were like, we're going to release a comic book every week um, written by four different people, by uh, Jeff Johns and Grant Morrison and um, and some others. Uh, I I think it was uh, either Giffen or Dave Matias. I forget which one of those is the writer of the group. Right. And uh, 
Wait, can you go, can you go more in about this? Yeah. And, uh, and it, you know, it, it was just a story of the DC universe. It was, it, it like covered a year in the DC universe where Batman and Wonder Woman were missing and Superman was without his powers. Mm-hmm. So like Clark Kent was there, but not Superman, which is way more interesting to me because it's like, how would reporter Clark Kent save the day? Like through his through awesome journalism, yes. Um, so it follows like characters that had at that point fallen a little bit out of favor, like Booster Gold and uh Blue Beetle, um, and uh, and um, not you know, the question, uh, yeah, the, the question, question Sh- that, yeah. Shazam and Black Adam, and um, and it's and it was just this like really fun, interesting book. Um, that just told these really tight stories that are really good at mystery. Um, and it's, and it's like, imagine if like 52 issues of a single comic were good. Like that's, <laughs> that's weird. Cause 52 issues of a comic, that's usually five years of someone's run on a comic. And it's like, no, these are all real good. These are real good comics. And then, of course, it was very successful. So they were like, "Now we're going to do this 19 more times. And like, so there was the thing called like the new 52. And that wasn't as good. And yeah. um, and they, they did like other shit where they released comics every week for 52 weeks. And it just, you know, they they tried to capture. They did what comic books always do, which is like, you know, they try to recapture lightning in a bottle. Right. And and there's um. Out. And there's one thing with like the big two that they just love to do is kind of like um, they really just try to look for the next big gimmick almost, you know. Mm, I'm listening. Or, or just something that's just like, um, just, just something that they'll know they'll get attention. I know for a good while, like, uh, Marvel was doing all sorts of like kind of like parody covers, you know, like oh we're gonna do a spoof on like rap covers for yes. a specific. Yes, uh, they line did of the comics. rap cover thing. Yes, mm-hmm. I saw the rap cover thing they did. They um they either would get uh they get a bunch of there's a lot of like variant covers you know by all sorts of like different artists they would um I remember one time they got like a bunch of manga artists to draw like the covers for uh, their comics and that, I I like I like that um I I got one of those it from a uh, from an Ant Man run written by uh, Nick Spencer. How do you feel about Nick Spencer as Do you know who Nick Spencer is? I don't know what I don't know much about him. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Tell me everything about Nicholas Spencer. Okay, he um do you remember that infamous, infamous Captain America panel where he said Hail Hydra? Oh yeah. That was great. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, Nick Spencer Nick Spencer wrote that. And um, but before he wrote that, he had a very he had this okay, you know what? Since you recommend me a comic, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you one of one of my favorite superhero comics from the past, like I'm listening. maybe twelve years. Have you heard of the comic, The Superior Foes of Spider Man? I read The Superior Spider Man, which I liked, but I don't know oh. the Superior Foes of Spider Man. Oh, it's it's really it's really good. It's like a it's not really connected to Superior Spider Man. Like you don't got to read it to like understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. But it's basically like this this there. They're the Sinister Six. They're they're they were the iteration at the time during Superior uh, Superior Spider Man, right? And they're they're a bunch of like they're a bunch of assholes. They're they're super villains, you know. They're a bunch of dicks, right? But they have these big plans, and their leader is uh is the Boomerang. You know Boomerang? Ah uh, yes, I do. Yeah, and 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 Boomerang is like this scumbag who's always like. Like he 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 makes it seem like oh yeah we're in this together but he always has like he's always ready to backstab anybody and he'll backstab anybody right because he gets involved with like higher powerful villains and even like Doctor Doom gets involved in this storyline right but he always like finds a way to like backstab someone either weasel its way out of like someone you know and it feels very it feels like almost like a like I guess imagine if hmm, I this might be a I'm not sure if this is appropriate to say, but it might be like if if Quentin Tarantino did like a Sinister Six movie, you know? Okay, yeah. So like a lot of violence, like a lot of like kind of noir, um, mm-hmm. you know, dialogue heavy. I get it. Yeah, yeah. It's and I mean, there's also a lot of like um, I like the shockers in it, you know, and he's like portrayed as like a a lame a lameo. No one likes him. Oh, he's like part. Of, yeah, he's part of the team. Um, 
there's this whole it's damn it's hard to describe without like spoiling too much of it but i highly recommend superior foes it really did make me think um uh nick spencer is like a really good writer like i think he's currently writing spider-man so i think that's why they got him on that and um after superior foes he did like a he did a run of ant-man that was pretty good it wasn't like as good as superior foes but it was like i liked it enough i i think uh i think the second ant-man movie is based specifically on his run of ant-man so if you like seen the ant-man movie it's kind of like if you've seen the sequel the ant-man and wasp it's kind of like the abridged version of his run of the comic you know fuck i wish i had a better way to describe superior foes but yeah i highly recommend it i think it's great all right is there uh is there anything any other book besides i you know what i remember back when i emailed you and i asked you if there was like a comic you wanted to talk about that i would also try to read and you did recommend 52 and i did get like maybe into one fourth into 52 i think and i and i was really enjoying it i think um one of my favorite let me let's see if you remember this part but i like the part where uh like there's a part where it's like renee montoya with the question and i think they're like they infiltrated like a LexCorp building or something and um and then suddenly like these gorillas start attacking them right like i think they're like humans that turn into like gorillas right oh yeah i think it's and, some like gorilla grod bullshit happens right right and um and then uh and then uh the bat woman shows up and uh like montoya montoya is gonna like shoot one of the gorillas but like a uh, bat woman like tells her not to because you know like ba- like bat people don't kill right and um and instead bat woman like flips the gorilla out of the fucking building like she literally just froze the gorilla out of the fucking building and it, i and i just laughed i fucking hella chuckled at that because like how the fuck is she gonna be like yeah don't kill let me just throw this gorilla out of the fucking building there was probably water the down there look if she's a bat <laughs> she's got bad in the title she's she's working the angles she's got this covered <laughs> Yeah, I, I did like 52. I like them. Um, I think I'm kind of a sucker for like comics that like either like go through like the history of like a universe or something or like a major event, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, have you heard of uh, X-Men Grand Design? I know everybody likes X-Men Grand Design. I know everybody loves the covers. I've never read it myself. Oh, uh, it's pretty. It's pretty good. It's like specifically like um, it's written by fuck, what's his name? Damn, I got his book. I can't believe it. Can't. Okay, it's, it's written by Ed Piscor, right? Mm-hmm. And um, what he does is like, so so you know, like X Men is written by different writers, you know, like no, um, so like there couldn't be like a way all these writers have like the same story ideas for like these characters, right? You know, when a new writer gets introduced, they usually throw everything aside from the previous writer and just do their own thing, right? That's well, true. um, yeah, what Ed Piscor does is that he um he gets everything from like. Uh, from the Jack Kirby Stan Lee run all the way to like the end of the Chris Claremont run and he writes he he combines it all like some sort of like almost like a documentary style of the retelling of of that whole like era of the comic but also making it seem like there was like a big plan like there was a there was a cohesive vision going on you know Mm -hmm. and that's the that's the grand design part right and it's pretty uh, cool yeah, it's 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 pretty cool. It's uh, yeah, like if you just like it when when like if you if you like like documentaries, it's kind of like a documentary comic, you know. Mm-hmm. And 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 the way it ends, like it doesn't really go up to like current modern comics. It just kind of stops where like Chris Claremont like leaves the book. Um, but the way the way it ends, like if you know anything about like the shenanigans that happened during Chris Chris Claremont era, it kind of like kind of loops in a way, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like. Like not not too much of a spoiler, but it kind of like loops in on itself almost, you know. Mm-hmm. So like, it's pretty um, it's pretty good. Highly recommend it. <laughs> well, I will have to check it out. A lot of a lot of people have recommended Grand Design. So mm-hmm. it sounds how, it sounds pretty cool. How often do you read comics, Asterios? Um, you know, I I get into moods like uh, a couple of years ago. I had the uh, Marvel Unlimited app, and mm-hmm. I I must have read like a thousand comic books that month because I was just like, now that I got the Marvel Unlimited app, I can finally read all the weird tie-in books that I could never afford. 
Because the Marvel Unlimited app is just, it's like an all you can eat, just download whatever you want. The comics on it are six months old, but they go back <laughs> to like the 40s. So I was like, let me read all the weird secret invasion tie in books and all the weird uh, siege tie in books and the, um, the, oh, what was it? Uh, um, the secret wars tie in mm. books were so great. It was so incredible. It was kind of like, what if the Age of Apocalypse treatment was just given to everything? Um, you know, so there's like a cowboy Logan, and there's like a group of intergalactic Thor cops, and uh, and Doctor Doom has made himself God in this universe. So, yeah, I, so yeah, it's kind of like at, the way every comic would n naturally relate to God, they relate that way to Doom. It was pretty cool. I re I really liked it. And so, yeah, and then, you know, and then sometimes I'll just get into a, a, a big mood on uh, comicsography and I'll just spend way more money than I have just buying weird little comics from Image that I've never heard of. And uh, and so, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just a very big fan. Any um any kind of like um what's the phrase? And you found any like bangers, any like secret hidden hidden gems? You know, it's, stuff like it's, that. I mean, it's interesting because it's kind of like, you know, yeah, one person's hidden gem is another person's old news. But I really, really liked um well, what was it called? Uh the Manhattan Projects, which mm. was uh this comic that came out a couple of years ago. I think it was Rick Remender um who wrote it, but I might be wrong. That was just like what if the guys behind the Manhattan Project were like evil super scientists? Like, what if Einstein was evil and uh, Werner von Braun? Obviously, he's already a goddamn Nazi, and uh, and you know, fi and Richard Feynman and all these people. Because it's like, yeah, you have to be pretty nuts to hang out underground making a doomsday device. So, uh, and, and, you know, it, it, so I thought that whole line of comments was really interesting. Had you ever heard of them? Uh, I think I've heard of the name Manhattan Project. That sounds very familiar to me. Um, I think a uh, another comic I would love to recommend is um, I um, you know the company IDW. Yes. Yeah. So I interned there actually. There's like a publication here in my in my hometown, and um, when I when I interned there, like um, they. I, I, I was using their computers and they have like the database of the entire, their entire catalog of everything they ever published is on their computer. So any comic they ever made, you could go ahead and read. Right. And like uh, my work mentor told me like, yeah, when you ever have downtime, you know, just read as many comics as you want. So I, so I did that. I did a lot of that. And um, one of the, one of the series that I really like is it's a comic. I don't know. I don't know if you heard of it. It's called Transformers versus GI Joe. I think I read a couple of those comics. Yes. Yeah, this was a run I think made in. Uh, it's not that old. I think it's a couple years old, but um, it's it's pretty it's pretty great. Like, what do you, okay? So, what do you think would happen in a Transformers versus GI Joe comic? What's like the first thing you would think? Um, I would think that Cobra and the Decepticons would form some sort of alliance that but then be planning on betraying each other the whole time. Mm -hmm. And the Autobots and Joes would be together, right? Like they would team up, right? Eventually. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, that's like not really what happens in this comic. It Ooh. goes in, it, what it does is it kind of like reboots both origins of GI Joe and Transformers together. Like it makes like an amalgamation of it. Okay. And it's, and it's like this, it becomes this giant, like kind of psychedelic, story about how like uh the transformers and humans have like an ancient ancestor together and everything kind of loops back in on itself and um like like for example like this isn't really much of a spoiler but in the first chapter like they kill like a uh, cobra commander right so this is like a world without like cobra commander and like also like megatron has taken over cybertron and he's made it like a giant like floating like war planet that moves around and conquers other worlds Mm -hmm. And he has like a he has like a medallion that's like Bumblebee's head that he like ripped off when they captured him, right? And um, and the Joes have to like the, the Joes like like find out about this giant war planet, and they do a mission where they gotta like they gotta get into like a I think they they get on a rocket ship and they fly over to to land on this on this motherfucker, right? Meanwhile, mm -hmm. there's like all these other like 
um, smaller factions. Like, there's a new set of, like, Cobra, and they have, like, their own agenda, and they team up with, like, the Decepticons, and they just plan to, like, take over, just take over the Earth. And it goes in so many fucking crazy directions. And what I really love, it's the art is done by Tom Scioli, and the way he draws every character and every Transformer, he, he draws them very much like the toys. So they it, it really just resembles, like, just toys, like, fighting each other, right? That's and very what, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's and like I it every page is like if every page is like a poster. I think like every page in this comic would make an unironically good poster, right? Mm-hmm. And I think what, what one of my favorite moments in the comic is um so there's there's a part where like uh like the new the new cobra is gonna send troops over to the to Cybertron. So they're they're sending their army to Cybertron because like now they now they made an alliance with Decepticons, right? Mm-hmm. And when they teleport over there, um, all all the majority of their troops get like fried through the teleportation process, except for Destro. Like Destro comes out like unscratched, right? <laughs> and and he's like, and 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 he's all like just a couple of bruises. And then and then like Tex appears near, um, like above him, uh, like it's it's a picture of like Megatron's face reflecting on Destro's like metal face. And then the text like appear above him and said like, "Meet your avatar, Gun God." Wow, it's, it's fucking rad as fuck too. Also, every single GI Joe shows up in this comic, and every single Transformer. Because every time they show up, they get like a quick little snippet of like their name and like a quick little phrase to just kind of describe them. You know, it's really fucking cool. Uh, the, but yeah, you should check that out. It's really good. It's written uh, Transformers versus GI Joe by uh, John Barber and Tom Scioli. I highly recommend it. Well, that sounds pretty cool, dude. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hell yeah! Damn, do you have a? Uh, is there any other comic uh, you recommend? Anything? Anything else you got in the in the old mind jogging? I, you know, I think that's I think that's probably a a pretty good starting place for people. Uh, fifty two, um, the original mm-hmm. fifty two. It's collected over four books. Um, I, I you know, I'm really into uh, I'm really into. Uh, the uh, Manhattan projects. And I guess one more would just be, uh, I really, really like planetary. Uh, planetary is just this incredible Warren Ellis comic um, that deals with like a, a, a gang of like hundred year old superheroes um, as they like spend th- like a century each defending the earth. It's really cool. Um, I, I just want to let you know, I probably got to go in a couple of minutes. Um, Maybe mm-hmm. uh, I should pop open your comic and we should see how uh, disgusting it is. Yes, yes, please. I want to hear the live reaction. <laughs> I would appreciate it. This, is, By the way, the comic Asterius is going to read. It's called The Villain Verse, which is actually free to read on a, on a Tumblr site um, out there. It's just villainverse.tumblr, t- right? And you can also buy a digital copy of it. There's currently... A prologue and five chap. Uh, no, there's a prologue and four chapters available to read now on Gumroad and at itch.io. So if you want, if you want to follow along with Asterios, so you can always just go to the Tumblr, or if you want to support me, you can always get a digital copy, right? So uh, you, you got, you got, we got it with you, Asterios. I'm holding it right here. Villain verse, the prologue and chapter one by Alfredo Morales. Now I'm just going to open up to a random page. Okay, I'm not looking. I'm just flipping through a random, flipping through a random, and stop. Okay. What it? What do you see? I see an entire clown's asshole. What are you doing <laughs> to me? I'm seeing a spread eagle clown here, and its asshole is winking at me, and a bunch of other clowns are coming out of it like its asshole is a clown car. What the hell is happening in this comic? See, see the thing is... It- I know that sounds crazy. I know that's hard to believe, but if you only flip to the page before it, it makes sense, I oh, promise. Oh, no, this is actually very... Oh, this is earned. Oh, wow, this is really tragic, actually. Okay. You know what? <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, I'm i sorry. I, I I assumed. And you know what that... You know what that makes you? Okay, it I'm looking... It... All right, I'm looking through this comic. I'm looking through this comic. All right, I'm not seeing any big-tittied... Jerk off clowns in this. 
No, what do you what do you mostly see? What's uh what's what is mostly appearing in the comic? There's someone under a mask. Is that a big titty clown under that mask? <laughs> I don't know. You have to you have to gonna have to read the the next chapters to see. Too. Okay. All right. The villain. All right. Seen some pretty cool fights. Pretty cool fights. All right. I'll yeah. read this comic and I'll send you one of my. All right, you DM me your address off air. You got right, me. I'll, I'll... There are no big t- so far. And mm-hmm. and by the way, I will be looking for them all night long, all night. Okay, yeah, I you should get give me the every time every time you think you found one, just just DM me, just DM me uh, which page it is, right? So I can just, long, so I'm just aware hard. where you're at. Long and hard for these big tippy clowns. All right, you send me your address. I'm sending you a free copy of my book, Toys for Cheap, which is a fake comic, which is a fake toy catalog filled with dangerous and insane toys. It's like if the Sears Wish Book uh, was written by a crazy person, and in this case, it was. And you can find Toys for Cheap. You can find a copy of it over at spiteincorporated.com. Or you can find it on Amazon by searching the word toys, the number four in the word. Toys for cheap, written by Asterios Coconuts. You're damn right it was. <laughs> wait, it wait, it's a comic, right? Who drew it? Um, what's his name? Um oh, it no. was written, it was drawn by uh the onions Jimmy Hasi. He's the guy that does Ooh. all of the art and design for the onion. And he's really good at really good at drawing. Oh hell yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I'll get that. I'll give my review, um, maybe on another episode or on Twitter. Who knows? Um, I need I need the uh, Stereos Coconuts. Once once you're done reading that, I need I need you to, to to give me the review, or make a tweet about it or something. If you yeah, think it's we'll good, see. Think- yeah, we'll look. <laughs> we'll stop. I'll read your book, okay? I'll read your book. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to build some sort of marketing campaign around your book. So far, you've passed the no big titty clowns test. We'll mm-hmm. see if you pa- if it actually passes the good comic test. But, buddy, okay. I'm so sorry I got to go. I got another podcast to hop to. Thank you so much for having me on. And listeners, it was fun yelling at you. I'll talk to you later. All right, thank you. That was the Stereos Coconuts. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.